but I'm, I'm going to try and do a fairly truncated view of what I was going to do. Um, presentation is, a, is evolved from other things I've done in the past. There's a kind of a three-hour version of this. You'll be very pleased to know that this won't be a three-hour version. I'm going to try and do it in roughly 10 to 15 minutes to give us time to have a questions um, at the end. Um, it was originally designed for Prezi. Who's used Prezi? Okay. Um, I'm not using Prezi because it's horribly inaccessible. Um, and therefore, although it looks really cool, um, it is fairly inappropriate in most educational contexts. But nonetheless, all of, those, all of those little numbered dots are interactive, so theoretically I can navigate my way back and forth if I want to. I don't necessarily do that in the 10-minute version, but if I was doing the three-hour version, there's all sorts of clever little tricks I'll talk you through um, as, we, as we go through. It is an interactive session. I was assuming we would have more people, and you are all supposed to have, as Robert has, uh, oh God, as you've got your, your interactive devices in front of you, you're all connected to the web, um, and therefore you are encouraged to try and engage in the presentation in one way or another. There are three options to engage. You can put your hands up, you can um, access the Padlet, which I'll show you in just a moment, or perhaps the easiest is just to um, tweet. If you do want to access the Padlet and make any comments, um, that is the URL. It's a shortened URL, so you don't have to do anything other than just remember that all of my URLs are bit.do URLs, and they all start SPA. So if you memorize that bit um, as we go through, you'll be fine. Um, if you are ever subjected to any of my workshops in the future, you will find that that is pretty much all of the webs will start that way. If you also have a QR scanner on your phone, um, some of you are trying that at the moment. It, in theory, that should be big enough to access. Someone put their hand up if that does work. Brilliant. So that's a quick way of giving someone access to a URL without asking them to, to type in a massive amount. Um, and obviously, if you do want to use the hashtag, please do. Uh, but you might want to include my, um, my handle so at the same time. And then... Back to the Padlet. The... Sorry, thank you. I told you I was going to do it quickly, Michael. Um, Got that? Yes. SPA Padlet. Okay, thank you. Got it? And again, just to show you that it is a navigable, it's sort of a Prezi-like presentation in that I can jump around using various hot points. I don't want to teach you to suck eggs, but I'm always amazed at how much people don't understand the functionality that is actually available in PowerPoint. So it is quite interesting. Um, so this is my last day at BPP, so I thought, you know, it's a fun farewell. Um, I, I wanted to um, try and capture, if you like, some of my personal history through this presentation, largely because I think my, my personal career, so 20 years to date in higher education, potentially does track e-learning. Um, when I got involved at Victoria University in 1998, um, I was managing, amongst other things, a centre for strategic decision-making, which was a networked uh, environment, um, and it wasn't yet online, wasn't wired uh, yet online. Even in 1998, there was still a lot of, of network-based applications rather than things being on the web. What's interesting, I think, is that um, the landscapes that I've worked in across a number of different universities have also really not evolved that much. So I started with WebCT, they moved to Blackboard at the time. Then I went to the Open University and we had something called First Class Centricity, which was basically a discussion forum. It wasn't a VLE. It was just a discussion board, a series of discussion boards. And then Merlin, which was a bespoke um, environment. Then Blackboard, then Sakai, which some of you may have heard of. It's an American system. It was uh, developed mostly by Stanford. Um, it was 60 developers sitting in a room developing a bespoke um, uh, environment that basically does everything that Blackboard does. Um, and then Moodle. And Moodle has become very widespread. Uh, its use is incredibly widespread now across most of the sector. But there are institutions, I had lunch with someone from the LSC at lunchtime, uh, and he told me that in the last seven years, they have not adapted Moodle at all. They just leave the, it's the vanilla version. They just do the updates. It means faculty can always 
access any help resource. It always looks exactly like it's supposed to, and they've taken that line of least resistance. BPP, obviously, we've got several different versions of Moodle across the piece, and we've customized it to some extent. Um, there are some advantages in that, but there are also some massive disadvantages. Um, I'll leave you to decide which is the best approach. So I want to talk through very briefly some of the uh, approaches, if you like, to, to learning. And I'm trying to set a context for the, what you will be faced with as academics uh, in the future. Disappointing that Anna's left. I was pitching this towards Anna, largely, to be honest, ish, if I say. I was talking to Anna, but there you go. Um, so. Yeah, that's true. Yes, Anna, watch this bit. Yeah. So I think it's really important just to recognise that we do actually um, fit in a very long history of education and communication. We can go back in the West to obviously the, the Greeks, we can go back to Christianity. Even in the East, we still have effectively the same model. The learned teacher, the person who sits, you gather around, you listen, you, you soak it in, usually under a tree or sitting at the front of a classroom. Um, we then effectively evolved a, a, a means of communicating learning through copying. And you think back to the way that, you know, think that the image of the Victorian schools where people are copying off what's on the board. Some fantastic images of massive blackboards available, literally floor to ceiling, wall to wall blackboards, people marking, writing things up, students copying them down. There is a rich history uh, for that. And when we started universities, we basically duplicated that. So this is a, an image from Bologna University. Um, these do all have alt tax um, uh, and in PowerPoint, <coughs> but they, they, it, 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 it essentially duplicates exactly the same model of communication. So my first reflective question, and we don't have time to ask you to, to, give, to repeat, ask your questions at the moment, but to, by all means, add them to Padlet if you want to, is how different is the context in which you now teach is from the context in which you were taught? What have been the radical changes from you as a student and you as a faculty member? I think one of the fundamental failings of higher education universally is that we don't tackle the question of how students come to know anything, how we come to know anything, and how students come to know. Effectively, we're talking about people's epistemological foundations. I know anyone that's done the PG cert knows I bang on about this quite often. I think it's really important that we think through why it is we think knowledge is what it is and why students think um, how they come to find out things about the world. We ran a project here at BPP in 2012 called the Poise Project, which was um, the personal orientation to an international student experience. That was really just to fit in with the Higher Education Academy, who had a focus on internationalization at the time. But what we did was we, we looked at what the literature said around people's personal epistemology. And there are, essentially, there are five bits of scholarship that relate, uh, that, that have given us this kind of um, model, if you like, of the factors that go into to students and faculties, conceptions of how they come to know. So people either, I know this won't be that legible, so it says, is knowledge, is knowledge quick or not at all? So certainly, there, if you think about some of your students, you will find some students who will say, yeah, I get that, but I can maths, I can never learn maths. It doesn't matter how, I just can't get maths. So those are people who are fixated on the idea that there are things that they'll either get or they won't ever get it. Authority or reason, this is a massive cultural issue that we have in our classrooms, particularly when we find that you've got, if you're, if you're a young female European member of staff, and you're faced with some young Bangladeshi boys, for example, who might be Muslim, you will find there is a culture clash that really resides around this notion. It's not about your gender. It's about your, your ability to have authority over them as a learning and teaching transmitter. So there are cultural issues, and I take that as an extreme example, but it's more subtle in lots of other ways, the way that our law faculty are very keen, quite understandably, to assert their leadership of their professional leadership of their classrooms, but that then sets up a dynamic with their students right from the outset. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Right? So 
Is knowledge innate or in acquired? Some people think culturally that knowledge is within them already and it just has to be released. And other people think actually they start as a tabula rasa, an empty palette, and they have to learn something from scratch. Is it simple or is it complex? Um, some people think that knowledge is basically very simple if you break it down. Some computer scientists will tell you that everything is mathematical and you can break everything down into very small bits and you can put it all back together again. Other people will say, actually, really, knowledge is quite complex. You know, does two and plus two always make four? You know, there might be reasons, cases when it doesn't. And then, is knowledge certain or tentative? In the West, we believe, generally, we, we Occidentals have a feeling that most knowledge is questionable. We can doubt pretty much anything. Right? So anything is questionable. All swans are white until you see a black one. Right? But there are people from different cultural contexts who come to believe that there is some knowledge that is absolute. Obviously, people with faith in the West are, may be the same, but there will be some things that are absolutely certain. Questioning that fundamental belief structure is something that higher education doesn't do. We tend to assume that the students come to us are kind of ready to learn kind of the way that we want to teach them. And I think that's arguably a fallacy. I think there's also an issue, which I obviously displayed some photographs of, of uh, how people have been teaching for centuries. I think there's also some issues around the spatial contracts that we have with our students. That's a 1905 classroom. 70 odd years later, the only thing that's changed is that instead of being a girls' school, it's a boys' school. But essentially, it's exactly the same model. Now, there are some differences in contemporary classrooms, in some schools, but when you think about the way universities have evolved, that's very progressive, mixed classes in 1905 in Texas. When you think about how contemporary universities very often deliver some of their learning, it hasn't changed at all. Now, you might say, ah, oh, but we, do, we don't do lectures, we do tutors, tu tutorials, we do seminars. So my question would be, is that a tutor-focused tutorial or is it really about the student so okay maybe we don't do it that model maybe we have got that kind of model and that's clearly much much more uh, focused on the student isn't it it's them working around their tables and although they are looking all, all at the tutor at the top and she does actually have a blackboard in front of her a whiteboard in front of her so my question is what our spatial agreements are with our students is 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 predetermined effectively so who thinks for example or, or, or hands up if you think A is the most suitable environment to run a seminar. C, you're just being difficult. C, would C be the suitable environment to a seminar? Yes, well, John thinks so. Obviously, other people just aren't participating because that's fairly obvious, isn't it? So I think the point is that there are certainly conventions. When you came in today, you weren't really expecting a workshop because you walk in and there are rows and you sit down and you're expecting to be presented to so I think that's a, there's essentially an unspoken contract just in the physical way that we set up our classrooms. So another reflective question, how much does the physical space you're allocated to teaching determine your ability to teach or how you teach? My, I suspect, I know from the PG Cert when I ask that question, it's almost universal. People will always say, well, yeah, kind of I have to teach that way and maybe I can move the, the furniture, but if I do, I'm inconveniencing the person that comes after me because they might not want to do it the same way and so on. So I think when you think about educational technology and the impact that that's had on learning and teaching practice, it's worth going right back to the beginning. I'm going to let you read those first. So the first one is from 1703, the second one is from 1815. So in 100 years, there's been a massive, well, there hasn't really, has there been? But, but effectively, the technology's changed, but the, the attitudes of teachers and parents and learners is, is pretty much the same. There was a fear of any new innovation. There was a time when paper was an, an educational technology. It was an innovation. We went from bark to something else. We went from slate to paper. So the, the, this combination, if you like, is this track, this... Uh, trend from one technology to another always encounters resistance. 
Students today depend on those expensive fountain pens. They can no longer write with a straight pen and nip. We parents must not allow them to wallow in such luxury to the detriment of learning how to cope in the real business world, which is not so extravagant. Literally, there, there was a massive reaction whenever you introduce anything that even looks remotely like a technological innovation. And ballpoint pens are clearly also expensive luxuries. We also, most of us, some of us, will remember a time when you might have had a mimeograph. Anyone old enough to have ever... Yes, indeed, thank you. At least I'm not the only person who's old enough to remember those. Um, but of course, once you've done one of those and you type that thing into your carbon thing, it was fairly precious. You know, normally you gave that to Sharon in the office who would file it away. Well, mine was Sharon, I don't know. You give that to Sharon and she'd file it away in the office um, and it would get used the following year until you needed to refresh it, but you weren't encouraged to refresh it because obviously they were quite expensive. Obviously, when photocopiers came in, it was so much easier to duplicate things. And so basically anyone could do their own thing. Things, there was quality control. Front office lost that quality control because clearly anyone could photocopy anything. From acetates to data show and back again, because these two sort of lived with each other, those of us that have ever used an acetate, you know, I, I remember going to a lecture, watching a lecturer coming in with a huge roll of acetates and putting it on the and then winding it through to that week's notes. Um, there's some nodding heads here. So that clearly also means that once you've written it down, it's fairly fixed. Data shows required you very often to produce individual slides. I mean, I remember actually the first time I used PowerPoint or a version of PowerPoint, I had to produce my PowerPoint, but I couldn't project it because there was nothing in the lecture theatre that would allow me to do that. I had to take it to AV, who would produce me slides, and then I could put slides into a slide projector that was mounted in the middle of the room. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that. And then we went from a kind of sort of analogy world where you had slides and acetates and handwritten things to PowerPoint. Um, once we got PowerPoint, then all of the bad accessible practices, the lack of QA, is released into the universe. Anybody can throw any old piece of rubbish, I'm being recorded, um, it, together, and as a result, the quality not just in terms of accessibility, but the learning and teaching quality definitely has suffered. So again, reflective question, when do you tra trace back to your original sense of your use of technology? When would you think you started using technology? Was it the first time you used Word? The first time you used a digital projector? The first time you used a VLE? Trying to think about when you started your journey, I think will change your perspective on the nature of your journey. I got a pen license in year five. Ah, it's impressive. That was it. Yeah. My first step. Yeah. So, so the, the reason that the reason the, the course the, the, the talk was entitled "The Walled Garden or the Open Jungle" was, I think, we're, in reality, we we all operate in universities as we do in monasteries, within a walled garden. The institution protects us and our students to an extent from external threats. And in digital terms, what that tends to mean is that we provide them with a safe curated space, that we don't allow them to say untruths, we don't allow them to say anything that's racist or sexist or defamatory. That's part of the model. That's part of the, the rationale for why a university provides a VLE and its, and its version of its own personal version of uh, Office 365 and whatever other applications are available. There's also a sense in which universities feel obliged to provide an access guarantee. You have to be able to guarantee that students do have access to this resource. If they were doing their own thing, they would constantly be on the phone asking for support. So that's the idea. You, you give them access to guarantee core resources. And the idea that effectively it's a tended garden, that there is support available, theoretically, for anyone who, who wants to know how to do things. Now, I personally think, I think the technical term is, I think that's a fallacy. Um, I think in reality, it's a part of the tradition. There was a time when you went to university because they had the libraries. You had to go to your library, university because they were the only ones that had the library. In fact, you had to go to that university because that was the only professor who had that book. There might have only been 10 versions of that book, and one of them was in the UK, and it was at Cambridge. 
So you went to Cambridge rather than Oxford, or Durham, or St. Andrews, because that's where you had to go to get access to that individual book. I don't think we've moved very far from that in our mindset. I think in reality, the digital world that our students operate in is incredibly complex. And they don't necessarily bring it into their classrooms. We know that they don't actively use the facilities that we give them very well or effectively, but they do live in a very different world. And indeed, you will also live in this kind of world now. Those of you that have been using Padlet today or Twitter or anything else, you are already operating outside of this walled garden. I think there is a trend towards aggregating devices, aggregating software that allows you to pull in lots and lots and lots of different strands of knowledge into your personal device. And those are already getting a foothold amongst our students. I think, arguably, we've tried to do something. Certainly, since I've been here at BPP, we've tried to do some interesting things to try and showcase some alternative communication models. But we are still struggling a little bit. So students escape the walled forums, and they move, them, move themselves to Facebook. Now, some of that might be psychological, because they want to get out from the walled garden. They just feel that they have to escape. But there might be a degree to which it's about the design, the environment itself. It's so much more attractive. But even if we made ours incredibly sexy, even if it really looked like Facebook, would they not still want to go outside? They don't like chat. Certainly, they don't, we don't use make a lot of chat in terms of Moodle, but they generally don't like it. Most of them will create WhatsApp groups. So again, another, another reflection to what extent you really feel that you do understand the technology environment in which your students are living and working. So I think, potentially, what, what we've tried to do at BPP recently is to try and model some of this. So there was so those people who were on the PG cert back in 2014, 2015 would have been exposed to an application called VoiceThread, which um, basically VoiceThread is this bit not the comments. The comments obviously don't generally appear until highlighted. When you put your cursor over an individual, you then see their comment. But it basically allows you to stimulate conversation through video, through audio, or through an image. And then there's a discussion forum that goes around it. Now, we've done some things on Moodle. We've put images and videos up at the top of discussion forums to prompt some discussion. So it's much more similar to this kind of environment. But it's a hugely, it's a, it's a completely different universe than a flat discussion forum that just asks students to respond to a prompted question, or indeed a completely blank forum that doesn't even have a seeded question in it. So VoiceThread is an alternative. There are also a couple of other interesting things that you can do, and I'm going to show you this one. Um, this was actually done last year for the students doing the, the student champions on the, for this year, last year's digital um, push. Super slow. So this, this is a PowerPoint slide that has then been uploaded into an application called HFP, which allows you to create a degree of interactivity. So I, all I've done is added hotspots. So it is a PowerPoint. The only thing that isn't on the PowerPoint are these orange pluses, okay? So this is just a PowerPoint. And what it allows you to do as a student is, let's say you come at this with a student because you're, you're doing an assignment on social media and how it fits. You might think, okay, well, I, I, I think about things temporally. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch these three videos first. I'm gonna think about it from a temporal perspective. Or it might be that actually you think about things more spatially. So you're gonna think about the desktop, the World Wide Web, the semantic web, right? So you might think about those things more spatially. Or you might actually be more interested in individual themes and practices. So you might actually be following workers, consumers, producers, consumers, prosumers, and avatars. Each, you, it, it, there's an option. Basically, you can decide how you want to navigate this. You might decide, I mean, if it was me, I would probably be doing this, right? But other people will decide where they want to navigate. Now, effectively, all it, all it is, is it provides you with the opportunity to provide some degree of interactivity. It allows you to add videos. Mass media, as we have known it, is over. And it's over for two reasons. The mass is over and the media has changed. 
Now we have instead the ability for everybody on the planet to talk with everybody else. At the present time, there's a creative explosion. As we unleash the creative power of millions of people, all of a sudden, there's an enormous range of things you can do without needing to ask for either help or permission. And that's new. So it allows you to embed more interactive content into uh, what is effectively, I've started with, a, with nothing but more than a PowerPoint. So I think, it's, I think it's just worth exploring a little bit what that might mean for, for you as learning designers. Um, those of you that are trying to design learning for meaningful implementation, you could be designing PowerPoints with a view to how they might be deployed. And then you might need to go and ask someone for advice. You might, you might go to Ishan, you might go to Richard, you might go to whoever you think is, is the appropriate source of support. But you could ask them to how, they, how you could change that content, make it more interactive. But the conceptual change, once you start thinking about interactivity for learners, um, requires you to be challenging lots of things, like the accessibility issue, for example. This is completely inaccessible. So you'd have to think about if you, if you, you either prepare it and you prepare to produce some kind of an alternative version, you might kind of just provide a PowerPoint and put headings, and, but you'd have to start somewhere else. So I recognize that this isn't perfect, but it does start to, to relatively easily um, tackle some of the questions that students often have. An easier, an even easier way of doing it is to just upload a YouTube video and then put um, prompts in. So this, this particular point, that box pops up, just pauses the video, just to allow that kind of degree of reflectivity. So I think it's just worth, I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of explain the sort of the history or track the history of educational development as quickly as possible and to then say why I think it matters for us as educators to be able to at least, at least to be able to manage the technology that we currently have. So the interactivity is maybe a bit beyond some people, but the fact that there are so many people who yet don't use styles in Word, for example, I think that's a disaster for higher education. I think that lack of understanding of the way in which what a well-formed document looks like basically under, undermines any prospect of us being able to move into the future. There is work going on at the moment around the notion of adaptive learning platforms. Um, it's in its infancy, it's, it's very corporate driven. Uh, most of the, the applications I think are fairly inadequate, but it's the idea that students will want personal pathways the ability to choose to read those bits, and then those bits, then those bits, or to take an alternative path. That kind of interactivity allows you to build a program. As a result of those individual, those personalized pathways, people are beginning to work on individual learning platforms. Google have been developing stuff that allows you to pull aggregated ideas together, to pull in a Khan Academy uh, video to do something and then pull in something from lynda.com and then annotate it internally and then submit that for an assessment. So, so to build stuff, that, that requires a degree of flexibility. There's a lack of standards around this area, certainly pedagogically. There are lots of technical standards, but there's very little in the way of pedagogical standards. Wearable learning, I still left this in. I must admit, the first time I presented a version of this many years ago, um, I, Google um, eyeglasses were kind of you know, on the agenda. The Google glasses was kind of on the agenda. But I think arguably there is still an argument to say that if, if technology is developing, certainly, certainly those things that are um, location and time context sensitive, the idea, for example, that when you get on the tube in the morning, your, your phone knows that you're on the tube for 20 minutes, and it might prompt you with something that you can read. And by swiping it right or left, you either say, I want to read it, or actually, if you swipe it right, it, it appears on your iPad when you turn your iPad on 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later or on your desktop half an hour later. The idea that that, that level of interactivity with content and learning basically allows people to um, develop this kind of landscape. Now, all of these things may seem somewhat fanciful, but the question would be, who's going to design them? If we leave it, as David said, you know, he, he drew the, the distinction between instructional designers, the role that instructional designers have, the role that content specialists have, and the, the classroom teachers have. Who, who are we going to leave to the future of educational design? We're going to leave it to the, to the instructional designer 
to, to always decide how students learn and what they should learn and when they should learn? Or are we going to take some sort of, uh, are we going to engage in this debate, in this discussion? I'm not 100% sure there are enough of you to make this activity meaningful, to be honest. But if you did, um, it would um, generate an interesting one-word list. But given that I can't imagine that more than three or four of you will bother, um, it's not going to produce an amazing word cloud. What I tried to do today was to show you some interactivity, show you uh, uh, an access of Padlet, QRR, QR codes, and poll uh, anywhere, all of which are free. I haven't paid for anything. So it's all been free software. Now, most people think they don't have the time to develop these things. They don't have time to play with these things. But I suspect that, that um, as I think both David and Chris have made the point, if you, if you do spend a little bit of time, you will actually save yourself time in the future. And for some of you, um, it may give you other career options in the future to, to be able to develop content in learning in a more um, flexible, more interactive way in the future will doubtless allow you to fit into future cultural changes in the landscape. Is that subtle enough? I think that's subtle. <laughs> right, I think that's me done. Thank you very much. Um, any, yeah, I was going to say, any questions? <coughs> At what stage of the program development and deployment we should consider all these things? Uh, is it when, uh, let's say, a module leaders develop the material, or is when we design the actual module? When do we think, when do we need to think about the students and right. the way they're learning? I think, I, think, I think ideally, um, so, so, I mean, Ishan, you're planning on promoting the learning design series in the next couple of months, is that right? Yeah, the learning design series so, is being promoted. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's, there's a, a learning design series that's been authored, which basically is supposed to take individuals right through from conceiving of a new module right through to evaluating it. Um, it's a series of nine steps. And my argument would be that if you engage in that kind of design conversation, you will start to tease out some of these issues. You, you may say, actually, I expect my students will want to be able to, to learn in an interactive way on a tablet or on a phone on the tube. I mean, when we had the shape conversation some time, time ago in PQ, those were the kinds of conversations people were having is, is it really important that, the, that it is mobile? And the conclusion was yes, right? So, so and anything, any other then decision about how you're going to provide questions and test questions, inevitably it had to be done in a mobile compatible way just to suit those particular students. So <coughs> I think arguably, yes, the earlier in the process you, you go, the better. But given, given that you have modules that you are intimately familiar with now, that you are currently teaching, there's an opportunity then to experiment. So, you know, to, to, for each you individually to think, okay, maybe, you know, maybe, you might, maybe you like that interactivity, that timeline that I put up. So and it's HF, H5P, really easy to Google. You can put it in WordPerfect, in WordPress, set up a free WordPress site, all three in WordPress. It is actually available for Moodle, but that would be a whole other conversation with BPP about getting it embedded in, BPP, in Moodle. It's already. Is it there already? Are you sure? We used it the other day. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So well, it wasn't last year when I no, did that. Brilliant. Okay. So, yeah. so, 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 basically, if you want to develop that kind of interactivity now, it's obviously available. So, that starting those thought processes now within a team with existing content will make you much more ready then to start a new module with a much broader open mind, rather than taking something that's fairly stale and copying it across. Right.